Hey everybody, this is Sean Leisha from A Blue Thread. I'm about to teach, or actually record a teaching on the Tuf Ta'am, the Karite Declaration of Faith. And it's a Karite custom to shave your head before teaching this for the first time. So I'm gonna do that and I'll come right back and I will uh, teach you. Hey everybody, this is Sean Leisha from A Blue Thread. I have now completed the ritual of shaving my head before teaching Tuf Ta'am. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I don't believe everything you hear about Karites on the internet. Uh, there is no Karite custom to shave one's head before reciting Tuf Tam, uh, before teaching Tuf Tam. I actually was exposed to lice, so I just shaved my head to get rid of any possibility of getting lice. That's it. Uh, today I want to teach you the Tuf Tam, the Karite's Declaration of Faith. I first taught this with James Walker, Yaakov Walker, uh, in 2021, I believe, um, during the pandemic, like a year into the pandemic. And um, I'm going to try to condense about an hour and a half of community and teaching and learning and questions down to maybe 30 minutes or so. And in doing so, I'm really going to try to avoid rushing through some of the beauty and structure of the Tuf Tam. Um, the Karite Declaration of Faith should not be confused with a principles of faith. Principles of faith are things that you believe inherently or should believe as a Jew. Uh, the Declaration of Faith incorporates some of those similar principles, but it is something you actually declare out loud. In the Karite case, we say it's during um, during the holidays. So each of the, uh, we'll call it non-Shabbat holidays commanded in the Torah. Uh, and a smaller version of this is actually set on Shabbat, and we'll talk about this later. So let me go ahead and share my screen. And as I do so, before I do so, I want you to do one thing. I want you to pause this and go ahead and get yourself a copy of the Tanakh. It'll be helpful for you as you go through this lecture. Um, so go ahead and pause this now and do that. And the second thing I want to say is something that James Walker impressed upon me when we were teaching this. He said, Sean, you come from a tradition where this has been recited in synagogues for generations upon generations upon generations, maybe even 800 years, 900 years it's been recited. Um, and it was his honor to learn this traditional Karite declaration and this traditional Karite melody for the declaration. But he told me more so it was his honor to teach this declaration to people. You know, he and I have known each other since maybe 2006, and we've stayed in touch. We've been able to communicate. We've been able to teach together. And he thought his his greatest honor with this was was not only to learn but to teach. So I want to thank everybody who taught me. I'll talk to them. I'll talk to you about them in a little bit. And I want to thank everybody out there who's teaching, not just the Tuf Tam, but other aspects of Karai uh, tradition. Okay, so I hope you have your Tanakh um, ready to go here. I first recorded this on, in 2021, June 30th, 2021. That's always a good day to do a learning because June 30th, 2021 is Yaakov Walker's birthday. Uh, July 1st, 20, sorry, June 30th every year is Yaakov Walker's birthday. Uh, July 1st every year is my birthday. And by the way, talk about false advertising. Look how young I look in this picture. Uh, this picture is from 2014. And uh, James, don't worry, you look exactly the same. You have an age today. I'm talking about myself. Uh, that picture is from 2014. I gave this learning in 2021, and now it's 2024. Uh, June 30th is also my parents' anniversary, so it's always fun to, for me to do a learning uh, on my parents' anniversary. So uh, let's get started with the Tuf Tam. When I did this presentation the first time, I dedicated it to Marisa Lotzi, Marisa Kotzi, my father's uncle. He's my father's mother's brother. Uh, he recited Tuf Tam beautifully. And to this day, to this very day, uh, I'm 45 now, to this very day, uh, the same voice that I remember hearing in my youth reciting Tuf Tam is the voice that I hear in my head when I'm practicing the Tuf Tam, when I'm envisioning the Tuf Tam, it's his voice that I hear to this day. So uh, it was really beautiful. And he wanted to teach me the Tuf Tam. Every year, he's like, he could see that I liked it. I, every time he would recite it, I'd kind of look over at him like this. I'm like, wow. Uh, and he, I was excited because it was something new. I don't hear it all the time. I hear it five, six times a year or whatever it is for the holidays. Uh, but you don't hear it all the time. So it was so exciting for me to hear something like this. And he could see that I love it, so he wanted to teach it to me. I'll teach you. And I always said, next year, next year, next year. Uh, he passed away in 1999 while I was at college, uh, and he never had the opportunity to teach me. And maybe said better, I never had the opportunity to learn from him, learn from the person whose voice I hear when I say it uh, and when I, when I practice it. And I try to emulate his performance of Tuf Tam. 
So my father taught it to me, taught me very beautifully. Uh, there's always like one or two sticking points for me. So I actually never mastered the Tuftam until uh, 2014 when Rachel Avadia, Rachel Avadia from the Kirai Jews of America, she made a recording for me at my request because I, I wanted to learn it and I also want to share it with some other people who were learning. So uh, thank you, Rachel Avadia. Thank you, Rachel, for recording it for me. It's because of you that I finally mastered it. So I want to thank you. I want to thank my father, my father's uncle, I guess that's my great uncle. And for all the other teachers out there, thank you very much. So I hope everybody listening today has an opportunity to learn uh, the Tuftam, the meaning of the Tuftam. Uh, if you want to hear the Tuftam, again, you can go to YouTube. It's on YouTube. It's also on Spotify. So you can hear it there. I'll put the links in the comments so you can find it. So now I want to say something about Yaakov. He learns so much and learns so much quickly and learns it really well because it's coming from his heart. You know, one time when he was studying for the Arab Shabbat services to be a Chazan for Friday night, um, he was talking to me about like, you know, how he prepared. He said, look, Sean, if the words are just words on a paper, my eyes can get lost. But if the words are impressed upon my heart, there's no way to get lost. So I thought that's pretty cool and really beautiful. So, okay. Um, this is the Tuftam. It's recited by a congregant, not by the Chazan, it's recited by a congregant on the holidays. Um, and we'll talk about exactly which holidays shortly. It's called the Tuftam because those are the first two words of the composition. Uh, it's very common for compositions to be named after the insipid. The insipid are the first two, three, four words. Many of you who are rabbinic Jews or rabbinic Jews, you know Adon Olam. Why is it called the Don Olam? Because those are the first two words. Yadid Nefesh. Why is it called Yadid Nefesh? Those are the first two words. Tuftam. Why is it called Tuftam? First two words. Uh, even if these things didn't actually have a formal name. So anyway, it's recited by a congregant during the holidays. And the congregant can be a man or a woman. Okay. Um, at, this is the kind of the end of the Tuftam here. At the very end, you see these lines marked by red. At the very end, the Tuftam has one line that is um, that is said specifically for each holiday. You can see here, Behaga uh, Matzot Omer, and that means on Haga Matzot, on the Feast of Matzah, the Feast of Matzot, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. One says, Behaga Matzot Shivat Yamim Emet. And by the way, what's really amazing here, oh, so let me just finish here. So and these are the other holidays. So Yom Teruah is coming up. Yom Teruah Omer. Yom Teruah Be'echad L'Chodesh HaShavi Emet. And what's amazing about this, this, I think it's hilarious, is that I, look, I have no idea what this says in Arabic. I don't read Arabic script. I sure as heck don't read Arabic scribble in Karite textbooks that were based off an 1891 printing of the Karite, uh, the Karite ser service from the Vilna printing. And this is probably written in the second half of the 20th century, maybe early 21st century. I, I don't know. It's obviously written by somebody who's much more comfortable in Arabic than English. So somebody clearly born in Egypt. Um, anyway, so I'm guessing what he did, and I, I know it's a man because I know which textbook this is, but uh, I'm guessing what he did is, um, which prayer book this is, I know whose it is. So uh, I guess what he did is he, like you would do in English, you would say, uh, if you're more familiar with English and Hebrew, you'd say Rosh Hashanah, Yom Teruah, whatever you would say in English, just so you could find it quickly. And I'm guessing that's what that says in Arabic. I, I don't know, though, okay? At the end of that line, if that one line for each holiday, the Chazan then comes back. Right? Remember I told you it's said by the congregants, but now the Chazan comes back in, and he says this part here, or she, please God, we should have many Chazaniyot. Uh, he, he says, or she says, Umitzotav, Hukotav, Ve'edotav, Umishpatav, Ve'chol Devarav, the congregation answers him at, okay? Um, this line here at the end also appears in our uh, services, in the Karait services every Shabbat. These, these lines here all the way to the end, okay? If you, uh, okay. If you're familiar with the Karait Shabbat services, we have this section here where the Chazan always says, Adonai Eloheinu Elechad, and the congregation answers him at, Betorato Temima, congregation answers him at, Okay, so the Tuftam is taking the place of this stuff in blue. This is an abbreviated declaration of faith, and you can see later when we talk about the the Tuftam. Uh, maybe I should say maybe that's an expanded declaration of faith, and this is the normal one. I don't know, but the point is that um, you will see that the Tuftam replaces this in the service. So like you don't say these lines that are bracketed in blue there, uh, and then when you get to the Tuftam, you'll see that some of these concepts 
are right there in the Tutam. Exact words. Vitora to Temima, exactly in the Tutam. Umita Shabeta Tefila. Munviav, in there as well. Okay, so uh, let's talk about the structure of the Tuftam. The Tuftam has 13 lines. Lines one through three are not really a declaration themselves. It's uh, words and phrases and passages, verses from the Tanakh to get yourself in the mindset to make the appropriate declarations that you need to make. So there's three lines like that. Uh, then there are uh, line four about attributes about God. Line five are attributes of Moses and his relationship to God. Uh, remember, Moses actually has no credibility on his own, right? So why is Moses the one who was able to give us the Torah and bring forth the Torah from God, right? Well, because of his relationship with God, right? His special relationship with God. That's why Moses is important. And so line five talks about Moses' relationship with God. It doesn't just say things like, it doesn't say things at all, like, and Moses was a very humble man. It doesn't say that. It's all about his relationship to God because that's what gives him credibility, okay? Line six are attributes about God's Torah. Um, and that's where you'll see things about the Torah, Torah, Temima. We saw that earlier in the Shabbat prayer. You'll see the same thing in the uh, Tuftam. Then you go to God's temple. So you go from God to Moses, to God's Torah, to God's temple. Uh, and then you'll also see uh, situation, sim similar language from the abbreviated Tuftam or the, maybe the regular tube time, who knows? Uh, and then the, the moon is the beginning of the month, the Aviv is the beginning of the year. We've talked about the moon and the Aviv in many times in many contexts. I don't know if I've done a formal learning on them. Maybe I will, um, who knows? Uh, God's prophets are sent in truth and righteousness is line 10 and lines 11 through 13 are God's holiday are true, should be God's holidays are true, uh, plus a line specific to each holiday. Cool, okay. So um, the first three lines I told you are not declarations. They're there to prepare you for the declaration. If you look at the Tuftam, after every declaration, there's the word emet said by the congregation. However, because the first three lines are not declarations, the congregation says nothing at the end of the first line. So to this hey emanti, the congregation says nothing at the second line, v'hatzlihu. The congregation only answers at the end of the third line with the words Uv Moshe Abdo and Moses' servants, okay? And then after that, it's emet, emet, emet. So we're going to make a declaration. The congregation is going to yell truth, declaration, truth, declaration, truth, emet, truth, okay? Declaration, truth. Uh, and then, as I mentioned to you, here, this is the end of Tuftam. Here's what the, con the congregant says on um, Yom Terah. It would be this line with the word emet highlighted. And then the Hazan continues here as we discussed. Okay, so um, now I'm going to talk to you about the analysis of the Tuftam. Again, I mentioned to you the first three lines are not uh, declarations of faith. They're really precepts from the Bible or um, verses from the Bible that uh, will help you get in the mode of saying the recitation. Uh, and the words are, teach me good judgment and knowledge, for I believe in your commandments. Believe in the Lord your God, and you will be established. Believe in His prophets, and you will prosper. And they believed in the Lord, in the Lord, and in Moses, His servant, of Moshe Avdo. Uh, and you could see here, there's an asterisk here that shows you where the community is going to respond. This is a great and beautiful way for Kerry to start a declaration of faith, right? So verses straight from the Tanakh before you get into declarations that uh, may be based in Tanakh but aren't actual verses directly from the Tanakh. So we've prepared ourselves for the declaration, and now we're in the declaration itself. The Lord our God, our creator, our redeemer, our maker, our holy one, is unique in the universe, truth. This is a list of attributes about God in alphabetical order. If you look at it, it says Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Yud, Kuf. Um, and um, this list appears from Eloheinu through uh, from maybe Adonai Eloheinu through um, Kedoshenu and many character and rabbinic sources. And the entire list from Adonai all the way through Amet gets, it appears in the Arab Shabbat, the Friday night services for the Karaites. Uh, so if you are familiar with the Friday night services, this line should look very familiar to you. Okay. Okay. So uh, remember, we went from God now to Moses. Remember, this is about Moses' relationship with God, not Moses, his his qualities on his own, not Moses the stutterer, not Moses the um not moses the uh the humble man um it's about moses relation to god it says and moses is his servant his prophet his messenger his desired one 
his chosen one, his beloved faithful emissary with signs and wonders. Um, so let's talk about this. So it's Moses as a servant, prophet, messenger, many places throughout the Nach. I'm not going to give you exact answers for all of them, but let's look at the next words here. Um, Retsuyo Behiro Ahuvo. His desired one, his chosen one, his beloved one. The These are like synonyms. Retsuyo Behiro Ahuvo are synonyms elaborating on Moshe Behiro in Psalms 106.23. So Psalms 106.23 says Moshe Behiro. And we've got some synonyms, Retsuyo, Ahuvo, that bracket Behiro uh, to add some beauty to the composition. Um, then it says he's a faithful emissary, Sir Ne'eman. What's amazing about this is that, uh, what's amazing about this is that um, this language appears in Proverbs 25, 13. But in Proverbs 25, 13, that Sir Ne'eman, the faithful emissary, is not Moses in particular. The faithful emissary is a generic emissary, not Moses, no, no one, no name given. Uh, and in rabbinic sources, and then obviously later Karite sources, it was repurposed, this language was repurposed to talk about Moses specifically. So when you see Sir Ne'eman in Proverbs, it's not about Moses in particular. When you see, or see, see Sir Ne'eman in liturgy, it can very well apply to Moses, and you see it quite often applying to Moses. Uh, with signs and wonders, Deuteronomy 34, 11, um, that language appears there, okay? Um, and we've gone from God to Moses to now God's Torah, okay? So God, God's servant Moses to God's Torah. Um, and I'm going to read it for you, and then we will go to the uh, the sources. And his Torah is perfect, sound, pure, right, clear, enlightening to the eyes, rejoicing to the heart, soothing to the soul, teaching wisdom to the simple, and it is more pleasant than gold, even the finest gold, and sweeter than honey and nectar, and beneficial to those who keep it and those who fulfill it to get much reward. Truth. Uh, so this is all about God's Torah, and you could see the sources here from Psalms 19.8. I've highlighted in green for you the places where this comes from in the Psalms, right? Look how much language of the Psalms are right there. What's interesting about this, remember early back at the beginning, I told you that the Shabbat version of this says, Torah Toha Temima. Well, it's right there. Torah Toha Temima, Torah Toha Temima. And his Torah is perfect, right? So the exact same language here, much more uh, elaborate here, but the exact same language that you see in the abbreviated one also appears here. Uh, Psalms 19.9 says, The precepts of the Lord are just, rejoicing the hearts. The instruction of the Lord is lucid, making the eyes light up. And you can see I've highlighted the portions from that that appear in the Tuftam. What's interesting about this that I think uh, I want to point out to you is that Pekudei Adonai is um, the precepts of Adonai. The precepts are masculine, plural, but the Torah is feminine, singular. So you have a transition of the words from, if you look here, Yesharim, to Hayeshara, because you have to go from masculine plural to feminine single. So all of these adjectives or verbs or whatever they are in the context go from um, go from uh, masculine plural to feminine singular because we're going from precepts to the Torah. Okay, uh, Psalms 1911. Uh, you could see again, I've highlighted for you where these comes from. Virtually every word from your appears in the, uh, or in some version of every word, appears in the uh, Tuftam. And again, you've gone from masculine plural to feminine singular. It says the Torah is more desirable, uh, the precepts are more desirable than gold, than much fine gold, sweeter than honey, than drippings of the comb. All this is there in the Tuftam. So it shows you how biblically based they really tried to make these declarations. So far, we'll talk about more in a second, but so far. Uh, and then Sachar Harbe. Um, really truly have no clue what, what this is a reference to. Just if I'm being honest with you, I don't, I don't have like a great grasp of this. It is possible and maybe even very likely that it's from Mishnah Avot 410, where it talks about the study of the Torah uh, will lead to, lead to a great reward. And here in the Tuftam is saying the study of the Torah, or the Torah itself will lead to a great reward. Uh, of course, the concept of great reward appears in Tanakh, uh, maybe in Genesis 15, but there it's not talking about the Torah. So the point is, there is some concept of the Torah giving you reward in rabbinic literature, and 
maybe possibly the Karaites who wrote this had uh, in mind that uh, the Torah gives reward because he knew the Mishnah. Uh, and many Karaites studied the Mishnah, and I encourage all of you to study the Mishnah, okay? Okay, so now we are at um, God's temple, right? We went from God's attributes about God to Moses to the um, Torah. Now we're at the temple. So, omita shabeta tefila. Remember earlier, I told you you're going to see that same language from the abbreviated or the Shabbat version here. Omita shabeta beta tefila is exactly what's there. Uh, so let's read this. And his temple is a house of prayer, the house of worship, the house of sacrifice, the house of pilgrimage feasts, the temple of the king, the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem, the holy city, truth. Okay, so house of prayer, that's easy. That comes from Isaiah 56. A house of Abedah, sacrifice and pil pilgrimage. There's no express source found uh, for these exact words uh, in the Tanakh, but it's a house of Abedah, sacrifice and pilgrimage. But it's all logic, right? The temple service is referred to as Avodah. Uh, it's a place of sacrifice. People do their pilgrimages there. That, that all makes sense, but there's no place where it says it's a house of uh, Avodah or a house of sacrifice or a house of pilgrimage, okay? Uh, the one that I think is really cool here is Temple of the King is in 713, but this does not refer to God's temple in Jerusalem. It refers to Yeroboam's perfidious temple in Bethel. And uh, what's amazing about it is that Later, Paitanim, both Rabbinites and Karaites, right? They went and they said, let's take this phrase of uh, Mikdash Melech, the uh, temple of the king, that applied to this very negative situation, this temple in Bethel, uh, and apply it to our temple in Jerusalem. So it's, this is uh, might be a little bit shocking at first if you understand that this is a language used in Amos 713 or Amos 713. Uh, but once you understand what's being done, is they're kind of kosherizing this uh, language about a negative temple and turning it into the language about the positive temple. Uh, and then uh, Lord of Hosts in Jerusalem, Isaiah 24, 23, very similar language there. I think in, in that verse, I don't have it in front of me, look at me, violating my own rules. Uh, it talks about, they actually have the word Sion as well, so Zion as well. Uh, so it's not exact language. Um, the holy city. So today we call Jerusalem the holy city. Everyone understands that as Jerusalem is a holy city, but the first appear in Isaiah 48 and Isaiah 52. So, Okay, uh, now we're going to get to the places where things, just like the last verse, you start seeing things that aren't exactly biblically based, right? So there you sa I said there's no exact source for it. it's the house of, of Abadah, a house of sacrifice, a house of pilgrimage, although it all makes logical sense. Here you have the same thing, although we have one problem here at the end that I'm going to talk to you about, which I find fascinating. Uh, let's read it first. And the moon in its, in its, I'm going to try again. Let's read it first. And the moon in its renewal, in its visibility, in its appearance to the eye, in the evening at the time of its testimony is a reliable witness in heaven, Selah, a valid sign and an indication for the beginning of the months according to the word of God. Uh, it's all very beautiful, but in fact, there is actually no express place, no express place where the word of God says that the new moon is for the months. It doesn't say that anywhere. Uh, so I was kind of like, mm, say Kimam RL, but I think about it every time. Okay. So um, cool. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the uh, the new moon. So um, I don't know when the Tuftan was written. Like I, I have no clue. And um, I think I, I spoke with Neria Heroe about it. He said he saw it in a manuscript and it was, it was from like the mourners of Zion period. So about a thousand years ago and 900 years ago, um, maybe 850 years ago, depending on and when you think the more, end of the mourners of Zion period was. Um, so this is a, an epistle, a letter from Daniel Al-Kumisi to the Jews in ancient Persia and modern day Iran. And he's talking about the new moon and it's fascinating, right? It says, now you are living in the midst of the kingdom of Ishmael, who are favorable to those who fix the new moon by lunar observation. Why then are you afraid of the Rabbinites? God will help you. So it doesn't say expressly that the Rabbinites are not following the new moon. I think that's a logical implication. I, I really do. But you could maybe squint your eyes and make the argument, maybe both Rabbinites and Karaites are following the new moon. And because they're both following the new moon, the uh, Islamic government, the kingdom of Ishmael would protect them. I don't think that's the case. I think it's pretty clear to me that the Rabbinites are not following the new moon in this time and place. 
uh, and the Karaites were. So um, Kumisi is encouraging them to be strong in their faith because they're citing the moon. So what's fascinating is that up until this day, from medieval times up until this day, Karaites are citing the new moon to set their months. I wish more and more Karaites were citing the new moon to set their months, right? Uh, but that's why it's in the Tuftam, because um, everybody understood that this was important to the Karaites. Okay? Uh, I'm not going to get into this, but I just want to point out to us, to you is that if you want more sources on the new moon and more sources on Karaite text, go buy Royal Attire. It's on Amazon. It's on thekaritepress.com. It's a fascinating book. The only thing I want to point out here, it says the giver of Torah at the very end, the giver of the Torah enjoined us to follow that practice, which was not limited to any specific place. So the point is that the, it's the local new moon in the Karite tradition that matters, okay? Uh, at least historically. Okay, so um, this book, Pathway to Jerusalem, is a translation of a, of a book written by Rabbi Ovadia Bartonoro, who traveled from Italy, from Bartonoro, to um, to Jerusalem. And um, he also wrote a commentary on Mishnah, a very famous rabbi. Uh, and he's talking about the Karaites. They, the Karaites, sanctify the new moon with witnesses. Look at that. The Tuf Tam talks about it, the importance of that. And Kamisi, uh, so uh, Bartonoro was born in 1450. So Kamisi lived about 500 years before Bartonoro. And uh, he's talking about the Karaites setting the new moon. 500 years later, Bartonur is talking about the Karaites citing new moon. It says they, the Karaites, sanctify the new moon with witnesses. Sometimes, due to conflicting testimony, the Karaites in Cairo will make Rosh Hashanah and, Yom, and Yom Kippur on a different day than the Karaites in Jerusalem. There are two Karait householders who live in today in Jerusalem, and they see nothing wrong with it. So I see nothing wrong with it either. First of all, it should be the local new moon. So I guess in theory, maybe possibly the Jerusalem moon or the yeah, the Jerusalem moon and the Cairo moon might be on different days, possibly, although they're very close geographically. Um, but um, but yeah, so again, I see nothing wrong with this either. So, all right, Ha'aviv, we're going to talk about Ha'aviv, Ha'amim Sa Beret Israel. Remember, um, we talked about the new moon is local new moon. And actually, if you go back here, you will see that in the declaration about the new moon, it says nothing about uh, it says nothing about Jerusalem or Israel or anything like that or land of Israel. It just says the new moon and its renewal and its visibility and its appearance of the eye in the evening. Right? It doesn't say where that because the historical character view was that it was the local new moon. Um, but now you fast forward here back to the Aviv and it says and the Aviv which is found in the land of Israel. Okay, the Aviv has to be found in the land of Israel. Like those words are missing from the new moon part, right? And the Aviv, which is found in the land of Israel in its time, in its manner, its nature, is, is a valid sign and an indication for the beginning of the years for the pilgrimages, feasts, holidays, according to the word of the God of hosts. Uh, this actually is more explicit in the Torah about uh, Aviv is the... Uh, is the beginning helps you set the beginning of the year. It's a little bit more explicit than uh, the new moon. Uh, we know that the first new moon, the, the new year is the first new moon after the Aviv is um, reaches a certain stage of ripeness in the land of Israel. Uh, you can read more about that somewhere else. So it's more explicit than um, than um, the new moon thing. So here, Kama Mar Elohei Hatzavot. I don't wince as much. I don't have to think as, as hard about it. Okay. So again, royal attire. What's interesting about this, what's fascinating to me about this is that you have Judah Hadassi, 12th century, Constantinople. Remember that. Constantinople, 12th century, talking about how the Karaites of his time and place would inquire about people who had visited the land of Israel and ask them if the... Um, and ask them whether the barley was aviv, okay? Which is fascinating. Like they were so intent on understanding the proper time for setting the year. Hey, you were in Israel? Tell me, what did the aviv look like? What did the barley look like? Is it ripe? Is it not ripe? When should we set our holidays, right? They were so intent on doing it. They were interrogating people who went, okay? Um, this Karate Israel Hamar V, by the way, there's books about him on the Karate Press. Um, and what's what's amazing about this guy is he this rabbi or this hacham he lived in uh, I believe fifteenth century probably the exact same time as Bartonor is traveling fifteenth century in Cairo okay so he's living in Cairo a few hundred years after 
uh, Hadassi in Constantinople, and he's talking about how the Karite communities from around the land of Israel would send people into the land of Israel to go find the Aviv, and then they would come back and report, okay? Yes, as these emissaries came to all these communities by the 10th of Nisan, so they would report back by the 10th of Nisan um, so that they could know when to celebrate Passover, okay? Um, awesome. Nisan, by the way, is the first month uh, of the of the Bible, of the biblical calendar. Okay, so now back to Bardanora. So I again, I think this is fascinating because you've got this uh, rabbinic sage, this rabbi, traveling for all the way to Jerusalem, and he says the Karaites in Cairo send messengers to Jerusalem every year. Oh my gosh, we just read a Karait testimony about that. The Karaites in Cairo send messengers to Jerusalem every year to see when spring has begun. According to the information they received, they decide whether or not to add a leap month to the year. Again, it could well be that the Karaites in Cairo, where Ma'aravi is, and that will add a month, and the Karaites in Constantinople, where Hadassi was, uh, will not. Nevertheless, they see nothing wrong with this. And everyone does what is right in his own eyes. I think that's awesome. Do what's right in your own eyes. I do want to say, though, and I don't have the Hebrew of what he wrote here. I just have the English. The This writing in his own eyes might be a polemic based on the book of Judges where there's no king and everyone was doing what's right in their eyes. It was a very negative thing there. Uh, here I take this as a compliment. And I think, again, today, uh, I believe that without a king, you have to do what's right in your own eyes um, in a positive way, not a negative way. So this might be a polemic, but I take it as a compliment. But anyway, I, the more important thing about this is that I showed you Karaite sources from Constantinople and from Egypt uh, about what they would do to deal with the Aviv. And Bartonoro is telling you exactly, oh, wow, look at this. The carrots of Constantinople might do this. The carrots of uh, Cairo might do this. And, and no one saw a problem with this. So I think that's amazing. Okay. So I remember way back at the beginning, we talked about Unviad and his prophets. It said in that small portion of the blue that's, uh, that we no longer say on the holidays. We don't say on the holidays, but we still say on Shabbat. Unviad, Emet, right there, Unviad. And his prophets, and his messengers, and his emissaries, and his seers, and his angels, which prophecy, and which are sent in truth and righteousness, truth and met. Okay, so um, that's the end of the tooth tom right there, right? So up here it says, Umoadav, Emet, Mikrai Kodesh. I guess I left that out of the translation. So Umoadav is his appointed times, Emet, Mikrai Kodesh. Uh, his uh, holy convocations, emet, and then you add the one line uh, for each holiday. So that's it. That's our learning. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you got something out of it, especially, look, if you're a Karite and you hear this every year during the holidays, I'm hopeful that you had an opportunity to understand in detail what you're saying and why you're saying it. Um, if you're new to this and you are uh, you want to become a Karite or you just want to understand different uh, movements within Judaism. I hope you got something out of it as well. Uh, I come from a place where I have a Karite tradition. I've been reciting these my whole life or hearing it my whole life. Uh, for a lot of you, it's new. I know that. And um, I hope that I was able to disambiguate some of this for you. Uh, take good care. Be well. Bye.